Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason DaCosta. Welcome to my show. Thank you for joining me today. Um, that song was Mask Off by uh, Future. It's a uh, pretty good tune, nice beat. Lyrics were a little harsh, so I blessed you with the instrumental. Um, but anyhow, today uh, I am going to be talking a little bit about the famed passage from Romans chapter 3, um, the all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God passage. Um, we, we are going to look briefly at where that uh, comes from. Uh, is it pertaining to us today? Was it just pertaining to Israel in their last days, or I'm sorry, in Israel's history? Um, we're going to look at a few things, but um, we're going to start in, the, uh, in Romans chapter 3. Uh, and we're going to just kind of read um, verse 9 forward. Now remember, we're going to uh, see that Paul is comparing Jews and Gentiles here. Okay, now because he's trying to um, break down the wall of hostility between the elect uh, of the Gentile world, those out in the nations, uh, and he's trying to um, let them know that they are of the same body as the Jews, the redeemed Jews, the elect Jews uh, from the house of, uh, from the, uh, house of Judah. So Paul is continuously trying to break this down and let them know that um, there's no distinction between the two in the new man, Christ Jesus. Um, <clears throat> remember that in Romans chapter 9, we have, and we're going to look at this in a minute, but we have Paul specifically telling us who these Gentiles were. Uh, he basically lays it out on a silver platter for us, but we still miss it, most of us. Um, so we got to remember that the focus doesn't sway. Paul is not speaking of... Um, elect diaspora Gentiles in one portion and then in the next chapter speaking of true Gentiles. No, it's all about those who are being redeemed um, from the curse of the first covenant. Uh, so in Romans chapter 3, we're going to read from verse 9 forward. It says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is knowledge of sin. All right, so right away we have to consider a lot of things here. That's a pretty juicy portion. Um, what we need to remember is that Paul is continuing on from his thoughts in Romans 1 and Romans 2. Uh, in Romans 1, we have a portion that is all about Israel. Since the creation of the covenant world, Paul says, um, they, although they knew God, they didn't glorify God, but instead they worshiped cows and four-footed things and idols, and their foolish hearts were darkened. All right, He says that God, I'm just paraphrasing here, but you can look at Romans 1. The context is all about Israel's history. Um, he says that although you know God um, showed them signs and wonders and, and revealed himself to them, um, they still chose to turn on him and ignore that. Um, so they were without excuse. Okay, They had the revelation of God. They had the, the covenant promises. They had God walking with them and the signs. Um, no other nation had these things. Um, so Israel was without excuse. When we get into Romans chapter 2, we see much of the same. Uh, Paul is just continuing the thought uh, from Romans 1. Um, he's saying basically that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, there's, there's, they've all turned aside. Um, in Romans chapter 2, he's talking about the coming day of wrath and the judgment according to works. Uh, he basically tells them that um, it would be at that point when they would inherit eternal life and some would inherit eternal condemnation or shame. So again, that was that was the same judgment according to works that Jesus said in Matthew 16 that was about to take place before some of them standing there died. This is not a different judgment according to works. Paul is a disciple of Jesus. He's speaking to the same um, audience that Jesus was, the elect, those who are being redeemed, uh, and he's explaining what's about to take place in their generation, that being the judgment according to works and the inheritance of the eternal promise, which uh, Romans 9, 1 to 4 says belong 
to Israel in the flesh. So we have uh, Romans 2, also, you know, continuing from Romans 1, all about Israel. Um, we see as Paul goes on towards the end, he talks about the judge, judgment of those under the law versus those outside of the law. And those that those outside of the law had the law written on their hearts and would be judged by it. Again, same context. This is the Jews, those who are observing the law. And this is the scattered diaspora, uh, the, uh, the scattered Israelites out in the nations, those who had the law written on their hearts. Even though they weren't under or weren't observing the law like the Jews were, they were still going to be judged by that law written on their hearts um, because they were under that covenantal curse from the beginning. So Paul is basically telling them that uh, this judgment according to works was coming. It was going to take place. Um, and he's, he, he doesn't separate that thought about the judgment according to the law written on their hearts. That statement there was part and parcel of what was about to take place. That was the uh, judgment according to works that Jesus said would occur in their generation. So again, the law written on the hearts was part of what was about to take place. Um, this is not a continual thing. This doesn't pertain to anybody other than the covenant people. But when we get into Romans chapter 3, we kind of forget everything. And, and most of us actually don't even place Romans 1 and Romans 2, right? We have that as a universal sort of thing where um, all people have had the revelation of God and they've all turned aside, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, the, the, the story shows that only Israel had the revelation of God and they had that direct link to Yahweh. Um, and they turned aside and they became foolish and darkened and they worshiped four-footed cows, as we see with Moses and as we see in 1 Kings chapter 12. This was all about them. This was their history. So um, Paul goes into to verse to chapter three, and he just continues that thought, and he says, um, you know, these things about all have sinned. Well, who are the all who have sinned? Um, you know, people would read that passage, and they'll say, look, all have sinned. It says all, 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 all. It's everybody. I don't care what you say. But again, it's just not knowing how to um, interpret the Bible and um, keep things in their proper context. The all there is not universal. The all is a uh, complete statement about those in context. It's a limited universal statement, meaning that it only applies to those within the context of what is being said. Um, all of those within the context were guilty, and all of those within the context had sinned and fallen short. And, and we're going to show that clearly here in a moment. Um, like I said in Romans chapter 9, um, Paul basically lays this out on a silver platter for us, uh, who the Gentiles were. In verse 22 of Romans 9, he says, What if God, wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory? Even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. And remember, Paul is writing to Romans, um, technically Gentiles. They're swallowed up by these Gentile nations, but these were elect diaspora. So Paul is saying, uh, even us whom he called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In other words, to these Gentiles. Um, he's not only calling Jews, but he's calling us of the Gentiles. And so he uh, basically says, um, but also of the Gentiles. And then uh, look what he says in uh, verse 25. He actually quotes Hosea. And he says, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who is not my beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people. There they shall be called sons of the living God. So we have um, this uh, referral back to Hosea, okay? And Hosea is actually um, speaking of Israel in Hosea chapter 1, um, towards the end in verse 10. It's all about the uh, restoration of the children of Israel. And it says in verse 10, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people, there it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. Then the children of Judah and the children of Israel shall be gathered together and appoint for themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for great will be the day of Jezreel. So we see that who is in focus in Hosea 1. It's all about Israel. It's all about the gathering of the children of Judah and the children of Israel um, from those places where it was said to them, you are not my people. At this point in their history, it will be said to them, you are sons of the living God. It's the restoration of Israel promise. Um, it doesn't take a lot to see that. 
So in Romans 9, Paul lays that out for us, who exactly these Gentiles who he was writing to were. They were the not my people of Hosea 1, which were the children of Israel. And then in verse 27 of Romans 9, he also quotes Isaiah, and he says this, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. So there it is. He, he basically just shows you who the Gentiles were. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Remember, he's answering the question, but also of the Gentiles. And then he says, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. And this is what Isaiah says. He says, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. All right, so again, very clear who this uh, was about. Uh, the Gentiles were the children of Israel. They were as the sand of the sea at that point, but the remnant of them would be brought back and saved. And look what he says in verse 28 of Romans 9. He says, For he will finish the work and cut it short, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Now, that just goes along with everything I've been saying, hasn't it? A short work, finish the work. It'll be a short work upon the earth. He'll cut it short in righteousness. How is that an eternal, ongoing, forever sort of deal if uh, Paul is basically limiting this to the remnant in these last days uh, and it would be a short work upon the earth? Just a, just something else to note. Um, so we know that in you know Romans 9 through 11, we basically see this. Romans 11 talks about the fullness of the Gentiles coming in, resulting in contributing to all Israel being saved. And it would be only at that point when all these foreigners from the nations were brought in that Jacob's sins would be forgiven. Um, but we know that that had to happen by the end of the age because they all had to be sealed before the coming of the Lord. Um, this is all tying in. So um, clearly the Gentiles who are being redeemed from uh, the Rome from Rome um, were the elect diaspora. Um, we know that in Romans 4, uh, verse 1, Paul actually says, Our father Abraham, he's speaking to the Romans. Why was Abraham their father? Again, because they were his descendants. Um, so back to kind of wrap this all together in Romans chapter 3, now that we've looked at uh, who the Gentiles actually were that were being written to in Rome. So in uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, we have Paul saying, uh, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Okay, now stop there. We can clearly see that, again, the two groups in focus here are the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, Gentiles simply meaning an outsider, someone in, the, in, the, in a foreign nation. Uh, but Paul's goal here is still to regather and gather the remnant according to election. All right. Um, when we look at Paul's language here, they have all turned aside. Um, we have to understand that you cannot turn away or deviate or turn aside from something unless you first had that something to begin with. Um, the Bible shows that no other nation had God. God dealt with no other nation the way he did with Israel. No other nation had the revelation of God. Amos 3, God says, You only to Israel have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquity. Um, so Romans 9, again, 1 through 4, shows us that only Israel was given these promises, these covenants, these laws. Um, they all belong to them. So you can't turn away from God if you never had God to begin with. And that is what the story shows. The story shows that no other nation had God. Only Israel did. Only the covenant people did. So this is all about them, okay? They have all turned aside, meaning, um, again, all needs to be understood in its limited context. And does it mean literally all at this point? No, of course it doesn't even mean literally all because there were elect believers at that time who have already been saved. They had already put their faith in Christ. They had been uh, received the Holy Spirit baptism and they, they were um, new cre creations. But um, again, the all have sinned is a covenant term. It's a covenant focus. It's the people in covenant. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, just like when Matthew 23, when Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said that they were filling up the measure of their father's guilt. That's a covenant guilt that was being filled up. That's not an individual guilt. It's just a group covenant corporate sort of idea. So this corporation, this corporate group had all sinned and all turned aside and fallen short. Um, but this is Israel. Again, um, they had turned aside. They had all become darkened and foolish. Like Paul says in Romans 1, although they knew God, they did not glorify God. Um, so their foolish hearts were darkened. This is all Israel. Um, but look at where Paul is actually pulling from in Romans chapter 3. He's pulling from two places. He's pulling from Isaiah 59 and he's pulling from Psalm 14. 
Um, psalm 14 is going to really kind of show you exactly where this comes from. Very short psalm. In verse 1, it says this, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. I'm sorry. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none who does good. All right. So who's he talking about? Verse 2, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. All right, so right away we see matching Romans 3. Um, even the Bible's reference Psalm 14 in Romans 3 as a footnote. Um, but this is clearly where Paul is pulling from verbatim, the same words. Um, and look what uh, it says as we continue on in Psalm 14. The next passage, verse 4, says this. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? There they are in great fear, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Now listen to this. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people. Let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. All right, so the whole point of that in, in Psalm 14 is speaking of Israel as a people, how they were corrupt, they have done abominable works, there's none in the, within Israel who do good. Again, it's a covenant statement, it's not meant to be taken strict literal, um, but he, lo, the Lord was looking down upon them to see if they had understood, to see if any of them se seeked him, um, but they had all turned aside, they have all become corrupt, corrupt, there was none who did good, no, not even one. Um, but then at the end, it says, oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. That's Christ. That's the deliverer coming out of Zion to turn Jacob's sins away. He says, when the Lord brings back the captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Again, so Psalm 14 shows us exactly who Paul is speaking of in Romans 3, and that is Israel. Okay, it has nothing to do with anybody else. It's all those within the context. Um, Isaiah 59 is also going to prove this. Um, Isaiah 59 verse 1 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Who is the God of Israel? Uh, let's see, Yahweh? Um, it was always your God. I am the Lord, your God. So who's he speaking to here? But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Then he says, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear you. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with sin. Your, your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. No one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. They hatch vipers' eggs and weave the spider's web. He who eats of their eggs dies. And from that which is crushed, a viper breaks out. Again, back to that Genesis uh, serpent, seed of the serpent kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> but look at verse 6. Their webs will not become garments, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destruction are in their paths. Listen to this. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. All right. So again, the context here is all about Israel. He says the way of peace they have not known in Isaiah 59. Well, what does Paul quote in Romans 3 verse uh, 15 forward? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So the entire focus here is on Israel and Isaiah 59 and how wicked they were and how they knew no peace and how they shed innocent blood and how they were vipers and serpents and they were just filled with abominable works, idolatry, the whole nine. And then we get to Romans 3 and Paul quotes that when he's speaking about all who have sinned. Is Paul speaking about all humanity, quoting from Psalm 14 with uh, Psalm 14 and Isaiah 59, which is all exclusively about the children of Israel? I think not. Paul is quoting them specifically because those passages um, were pertaining to the children of Israel, just like Paul is speaking about the children of Israel um, when he is talking about the Gentiles here, okay? Um, and the Jews and Gentiles, Israel as a whole. And just to kind of wrap this up, when we look at verse 19 in Romans chapter 3, Paul says this, 
Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All right, so look at that. What the Bible tells us that only Israel had the law, Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 14, Amos 3, uh, Psalm 147, Romans chapter 9, on and on. Only Israel had the law of God. Jesus came to nail that law to the cross, to the cross, Colossians 2, all right? So that curse, which was the law, it says here in Romans chapter 3, whatever the law says, it says to those who are under that law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. All the world may become guilty. So who is the world? The world can only be those under the law. Listen to this again. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. So the world is those who are under the law, the covenant world, okay? This is Israel. This is the people of God. This is all that's in focus here. And when we take that over to John three sixteen, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, you know, believes on him... That world is the same world in focus here. It's the same world that Paul says the present form of this world is passing away. It's the covenant world. It's the world of Israel. They were in that the last days of that world. It was coming to a close. All right, And as we know, indeed, Christ came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to his own. Um, he so loved the world that he gave his life. Uh, Hebrews 9.15 states that he died for sins committed under that first covenant. And on and on and on. So you can see how this all ties together and you can see clearly how I got here. Um, it's not, you know, heretical to get to this position. It just makes sense of the Bible in its entirety, not taking a passage and applying it to them and taking a passage and applying it to me like the old uh, pluck a rose petal. He loves me. He loves me not. No, this is all about Israel. Um, all these passages pertain to Israel. Romans 1, 2, 3. It's all about Israel's history. Um, it's universal in a limited context, meaning all those within the covenant context. It does not apply to the Roman armies that were about to come in and wipe them out. It doesn't apply to you and me today. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about uh, this portion here. Um, but hope you guys... Uh, got something out of that to me that that portion is taken completely out of context by so many people um, especially Calvinists um, I being once one of them you know we like to use that and say look it says all have sinned and fall short and we do that because we know or we at least we think we know that Romans is indeed a letter to us right is how many times have you said that in your past you know Romans is a letter to Gentiles Paul is writing to Rome because that's just what people do um, to include all humanity in this story. They look at the book of Romans um, and they think that that book is sort of like our, um, you know, directed and written towards us. And indeed, it says all have sinned. But of course, totally unaware of what the Old Testament states and where Paul is pulling from in all of these texts, um, they just miss the complete story that this was actually, um, these were actually the scattered elect of Israel who had been pushed out to the nations. But we're going to be fished back in the last days in accordance with Jeremiah chapter 16. So anyways, thanks for listening, guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. And um, we'll be back sh uh, soon with another teaching. Uh, have a great day, everybody. And take care.